hunters spend their lives tracking down families of people who've died without leaving a will. They hand over thousands of pounds to long-lost relatives who had no idea they were in line for a windfall. Could they be knocking at your door? Today on Air Hunters, the Fraser's team are frantically chasing blood relatives on a valuable estate, but they're not the only ones in the hunt. Whilst I was there, two other companies rang up. But what they don't know is that this case has a shocking twist. At that time, it was just like somebody hitting you with a cricket bat. Plus, two sisters who thought they were only children are brought together after a lifetime apart. Oh, you're all steamed up. <laughs> And we'll have details of the hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of unclaimed estates held by the Treasury. Could you be a rightful heir and in line for a windfall? Amazingly, two out of three people in Britain have no will. If they die without one and no family is found, all their cash goes straight into the government's coffers. Last year, the Treasury advertised millions of pounds worth of unclaimed assets, of which a whopping 18 million went straight to the government. Across the UK, more than 30 probate research companies compete to find missing heirs and help them claim the cash. One company, Fraser & Fraser, is run by family members Charles, Andrew and Neil Fraser. In the last 10 years, work carried out by Fraser & Fraser has enabled over £100 million to be inherited. It's a different story, it's a different journey every day. We're tracing a, a different family and trying to find new heirs. Never, ever become stale. And it's just one of the things which I love about what we do. It's Thursday, the day the Treasury published the list of unclaimed estates. In the central London office, partner Neil thinks he's found a case worth investigating. The first case we're working is Charlotte Walker. Um, she dies in Barnsley um, earlier this year. It looks like it's a good case because it would appear that she owns uh, a property there. So value-wise, could be up to 100, 150,000. Charlotte Walker, known to her friends as Lottie, lived in this modest 1930s semi in the mining town of Elsica, just outside of Barnsley. She was a colourful character in the village, and her husband's nephew Peter and his daughter Linda remember her fondly. She was a jolly, happy person. She liked meeting people, uh, holidays. She adored going away. She was the first person in the family to fly on an aeroplane on holiday with, with her husband from Blackpool. Lottie and her husband, Lydon, were married in 1934, and when he died, they had been together for 49 years. She missed Lydon, I would say, every day, from the yeah. day he died to the day she died. Every time you went, she always mentioned him in some way, but she wasn't, she wasn't a sad person. She was always glad for the years they had. The couple never had children of their own, but that didn't stop Charlotte sharing her love of life. She was always young at heart. When she was 80, um, she had a bouncy castle for a birthday because she'd seen one on the television and she wanted one for the children. And before the end of the party, she actually had to go on the bouncy castle and have a bounce with the children. And at the age of 100, she had plenty of birthday parties. On Lottie's 100th birthday, she got a, a telegram from the Queen and right up to a couple of days before her birthday, she kept saying, I'm not going to be 100, I'm not going to be 100 and I don't want a card from her because I'm not sending her one. And, but actually on the day, she was absolutely thrilled with it. Charlotte was close to her family and spent a lot of time with them. But Fraser and Fraser had no idea of this when they started researching her family tree. And what would become crucial in this case is that Peter and Linda were members of her husband's family, not Charlotte's own blood relatives. Neil has valued her estate at at least £100,000. It's a lot of money, and the race is now on to find Charlotte's heirs. The team need to work fast. At this stage of the investigation, all that the team know about Charlotte is her name and address. Neil has asked case manager Tony Pledger to manage the hunt. I'm you from central London from a company of probate researchers. And he's delegated the office legwork to Simon and Debbie. They also need to get someone up to Barnsley to speak to Charlotte's neighbours. Fraser's employ a dedicated team of travelling air hunters. They spend every Thursday ready to travel across the UK, wherever the hunt for airs takes them. 
they collect certificates, talk to neighbours, and ultimately, they will speak to heirs. I'm trying to get to speak to Lillian. With all the travelling researchers who live in the north already on other jobs, Neil is having to look further afield. He's calling Sussex-based Bob Smith. So, so go to Barnsley, yeah? Up north, yeah. Sorry, mate. Barns Barnsley, it's a long drive. The case is Charlotte Walker, need bot. Take care, mate. Bye. Cheers, Neil. Bye. Here I live in deepest Sussex, and I've been asked to go to Yorkshire, to Barnsley. Never been there before, so it's quite exciting. It promises to be a long day for Bob. Barnsley is a 215-mile journey north. Now, Bob's got to go all the way around the M25 and, and up the M1 before he can get to Barnsley, so that's going to take a while. While Bob heads north, the team in the office are trying to get a head start. Researcher Debbie is scouring the birth records in the Barnsley area. Neil thinks that this case will be interesting to work. Charlotte dies in 2009, but she's actually born in 1908, so she's over 100 years old when she, when she dies. And this is, uh, there's not many cases which, uh, which are over 100. Using birth records they have on file for the Barnsley area, Debbie has traced Charlotte's parents' address in 1908. She's now looking at the 1911 census, hoping to find Charlotte's family. The census is a national survey conducted every 10 years. It lists the names, ages and genders of all the people living at every address in the UK. The census will tell Debbie if Charlotte, who was three at the time, had any siblings living with her. And it looks like Debbie has struck gold. Just find the family, hopefully, if it's the right family in the 1911 census. And it's just a case of piecing it together now and seeing if there's any more issue. Now the team can begin to put together a family tree. Air hunters use trees like treasure maps, taking the family back generation by generation until they find blood relatives in line to inherit. So apparently there was five children before the 1911. Three are still living and two are dead. Charlotte's parents were William Bott, a minor, and Sarah Whitehouse. She was the youngest of five girls, but only three, Kate, Lily and Charlotte herself, had survived into adulthood. As Charlotte had no children, her sisters, Kate and Lily's descendants, would be near kin and in line to inherit. Case manager Simon Grosvenor is trying to find out if Lily and Kate had any children. We can see if we can find marriages for the two sisters and if we can then find deaths and children and then get the certificates to show that the two we've found are indeed sisters of Charlotte and that the marriages we've got for them are right. But with an estate of at least £100,000, the competition will be fierce, so the team will also look at cousins. While they can't rule out there aren't any nieces and nephews, Tony will go back in the family tree to look for brothers and sisters for Charlotte's mum and dad. His aim is to find living cousins who might be heirs. We're speculating on whether we've got, we've got the mother of the deceased from the 1891 or we haven't. And if we have, then she's possibly got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine brothers and sisters. Simon is hoping to find these people. William Henry up here, we've got on this, on this census. He has a brother, James, and a sister, Elizabeth. Charlotte's father, William, had a brother, James, who went on to have four children. Florence, John, Leonard and James. They would have been Charlotte's first cousins. Unfortunately, they have all passed away, but their children might be still alive. Simon has found someone he thinks might be John's son. He's called Alan Bott, and he's living in Nottinghamshire somewhere. Hello, sorry, sorry, Mr Bott. Well, sir, hello. Um, my name is Tony Pledger, and I work for a company called Fraser & Fraser. And what we do is that we trace missing heirs, and I'm hoping that your father would have been John James William Bott. What we'd like to do is, is to, if I could, make an arrangement for somebody to come and see you later on today. But Mr Bott lives in Nottinghamshire, and the only travelling air hunter available is Bob, who's on his way to Barnsley. Hello, Bob. Hello, Tom. Where are you going to? Well, I've just put in Barnsley. Try taking Barnsley out and put in Newark, Nottinghamshire. Oh, right. Oh, OK. <laughs> Two and a half hours after I've left my home, I'm to head towards Newark, which is in Nottinghamshire, rather than Barnsley. Um, and uh, go and see this guy. See what he knows about the family and the deceased and uh, hopefully get a signature. Back at the office, Tony knows he's taking a calculated risk. We're not ruling out near kin, but we do have positive cousins, so we're going to go and see those at the same time as we're trying to establish the near kin aspect of it. If Charlotte's sisters did have any children, their claim will take precedence over any cousins. 
the air hunters must pray that their decision to send Bob to Nottinghamshire won't cost them an air in Barnsley. Still to come, the air hunters are having to be inventive. He was using the name Winsper uh, and he's just picked up people in the right area in the phone book. Um, now from the sounds of it, he's got quite lucky. In the search for missing relatives, the air hunters often uncover families torn apart by separation. For Jeremy Ford of Hoopers, one of the greatest rewards is when his work brings a family back together. When we work on these matters, it, it's not at times just about the, the, the money or, or the windfall or the financial gain. Uh, there can be a lot more to it than that, and we do from time to time experience cases when heirs do specifically request to be linked up with uh, family members. But when it involves a parent who has abandoned their children or started a new family, it can be especially difficult to come to terms with. This is the story of two women who both grew up thinking they were only children. But the air hunter's research discovered they had the same dad. They were half-sisters. That was my mum and dad in 1944 when they got married. Yeah. Shirley Hughes, seen here with her aunt Marjorie, was three when her father left the family home in Liverpool to work in the West Midlands, and she never heard from him again. I can vaguely remember him when I was little, but I don't know a great deal about him. No one else seems to know much. The, the people that could answer those questions are now both passed away, my mum and my auntie. So I have to rely on aunties and uncles to, to try and fill in the gaps. Well, this one is a better one of your dad, I think. Obviously, I'd wonder why they split up. Um, I didn't know whether perhaps... It was because of work or whether there was anything else that was involved, but it was just kept quiet. No one would discuss it. 150 miles to the south in Tipton, West Midlands, Joyce Coley had grown up the apple of her father's eye. My dad was, uh, what do you call the gentle giant? He was almost six foot four, 19 and a half stone. <laughs> He's quite a big chap, and he was a real softy. He always bought me everything I ever wanted, never, never questioned anything. But when her father died suddenly when she was 15, her world changed radically. He was like losing a, a limb. He was dad, a perfect dad. And you couldn't want for any more, anything more from him. And with her father's passing, she missed siblings to share her memories with. I grew up on my own. I had a step-sister and a step-brother, but they had married and gone by the time I came on the scene. So... I was pretty much alone. But the sisters were about to find out that they weren't alone. 200 miles to the south in London, probate research company Hoopers had begun a case tracing heirs to the estate of Cyril Curtis. He had died in Great Yarmouth in 2008, leaving a £23,000 estate, but no will. Cyril was 80 years old when he died. Towards the end of his life, he was very reclusive. The air hunters had little to work with. Jeremy Ford led the case. Well, the very outside, it's a very much a sort of blank canvas scenario. Um, no idea what became of the deceased, and we were able to establish that he never married or indeed had any children uh, and was uh, a child of uh, Frederick and Helen uh, Curtis, who married also in Great Yarmouth, and we started piecing the jigsaw together. The researchers were quick to find Cyril's brothers and sisters. Father Fred had been married twice, and Cyril was one of his six children. If any of Cyril's brothers and sisters or their offspring were alive, they would be heirs. We established that one of Cyril's brothers was uh, Leonard Edgar Curtis. It was while the team were investigating Leonard that they came across a family secret which had been buried for more than 50 years. We, we did trace the family, um, and that brought us on to um, uh, tracing a daughter. Uh, by the name of Joyce, who later became Joyce Coley, um, whose mother was Emily, and we established that her parents never married. It seems that in 1956, Leonard had a child, Joyce, with his partner, Emily Shepherd. Emily had two previous children, Jill and Robert, but as they weren't legally adopted by Leonard, they were not heirs to Cyril. Joyce, on the other hand, was Cyril's niece, and therefore an heir. <laughs> Silly lad. There we go, there we go. The news of her Uncle Cyril and her father's family came as quite a surprise for Joyce, 
as she'd never known much about her father's background. I had no idea about Cyril or any other brothers or sisters. Nobody had ever mentioned them. So it was, you know, it was a total shock to hear about such things, especially at my age. Although she was brought up by Leonard, Joyce knew very little about her father's past. I wasn't allowed to, to ask questions. If I did at any time ask, you know, if I'd got any uncles, aunties or anything on my dad's side, the questions was never answered, never. Although Joyce had been located, the case was far from closed. Before being presented to the Treasury, every case must be thoroughly investigated. Through the course of the research, another bigger secret emerged. As a result of digging around a little bit more um, regarding the death of, um, of Leonard, uh, we established that the administrator of his estate was a lady by the name of Hilda Curtis. And we thought, well, who, who is this person? Uh, so it, it, what we had to do next was try and fit her in. Uh, and we did establish that Leonard did marry Hilda. Uh, this marriage took place in 1944. From that marriage, we carried out a birth search and we established that he did have a child from that marriage, a daughter by the name of Shirley. Prior to meeting Emily and having Joyce, Leonard Curtis had married Hilda Tomlinson, whom he'd never divorced. Together, in 1948, they had a daughter, Shirley. Like Joyce, she too was a niece to Cyril and an heir. So then we were in a situation we'd found Leonard's marriage, a daughter from that marriage. Uh, we had evidence of a, a subsequent relationship and a daughter from that relationship. Um, and we were, had the feeling that neither of them knew of the other existence. Jeremy knew to proceed with caution in breaking the news. It's quite an uh, emotional, involved situation. They, they find out about their uncle Cyril. Uh, they never even knew of this person. And they found out that they did have a half-sibling. For Shirley, the news that she had family was very exciting. When Jeremy spoke to me from Hooper's um, and he told me about Joyce, and he said that some, I said I'd like to meet her perhaps one day, um, and he did say to me that if I wanted to, I could write a letter and he would forward it on to her. I didn't hesitate. I just um, wrote a letter, probably a lot of garbage was in it, but I wrote that I was um, who I was, uh, that I was married with four children, um, and that we both shared the same dad. And it would be lovely to hear from her um, when she felt the time was right. Shirley wrote her a letter in September, but as days, weeks and then months passed, Shirley heard nothing. You're waiting, and every time the phone went, um, I think it was her ringing. Um, the post went, the letterbox would go, and I'd keep looking for a letter. Christmas came, I was looking for a Christmas card. In Tipton, Joyce was trying to come to terms with what she'd learnt. When I first got the letter from Shirley, it was a mixture of emotions. It was excitement, it was fear. It was everything you could ever think of. It was... An excitement. I wanted to see her, but I didn't want to see her. It was so many years, and I just wondered how she would accept me, uh, what she expected of me. I know what I expected of her. I wanted a big sister, the big sister I never had. For Shirley, family is everything. He has his own name badge, don't he? She gave up work a few years ago to help out with son Tony and granddaughter Jennifer. I, I never had a large family when I was little. I was just me on my own. And I always said this, yes, I'd like to have a big family one day. See you later. Bye. See you later. It was March, and after six months of waiting for a response from Joyce, Shirley wondered whether the chance to know more about her family might be slipping away. I've just left us up to her but it would be nice to hear from her, even if it was just to say, to acknowledge I received your letter, um, but I don't think we should go further. In Tipton, Joyce was struggling to come to terms with things. I will contact her, but it's getting straight in my mind what's gone on in my life. I want to get that straight first, and then I can move on. You know, it's a big step. It's a real big step, you know, and that I will do it. I 
kept the card that she sent me and I kept it I kept it on the fireplace for five months and I kept picking it up and I put it down and I'd looked at the phone number that was on the bottom and should I contact or shouldn't I? I'd just decided the one afternoon I'd been to work and I'd had a rough day and I came back and I was sitting there and I thought, do it. I was excited when I answered the phone to her and realised it was her because I thought, well, at last, she's acknowledging me. Um, and as the conversation went on, um, she seemed to relax a little bit more and she she lost her nervousness. The sisters arranged to meet in a hotel in late March. Oh, that cab journey was nerve-wracking. My stomach was all knotted and... I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what she'd be like, whether she'd be tall or or what. Neither Shirley nor Joyce had even seen a photo of the other. When we were sitting in the hotel foyer waiting for Shirley to come in, I'd got butterflies, I had stomach ache, and I thought I'd made a mistake. But after all those years apart, would the sisters really be able to connect? Still to come. If the sisters find common ground, will they be able to bury the ghosts of the past? Why was it such a secret? I don't understand. I don't think I ever will. And I don't think I'll ever find out the truth. But it would be nice to ask those questions now. I just wish he was here. For every case that is solved, there are still thousands that remain a mystery. Currently, over 3,000 names drawn from across the country are on the Treasury's unsolved case list. With estates valued at anything from 5,000 to millions of pounds, the rightful heirs are out there somewhere. Today, we've got two cases air hunters have so far failed to solve. Could you be the key? Could you be in line for a payout? Kathleen Marion Coomer died in Dartmouth on the 4th of February 2006. Was Kathleen a friend or neighbour of yours? Could you even be related to her and entitled to her legacy? William Daly passed away on the 4th of December 2004 in Highgate Hill, London. So far, every attempt to find his rightful heir has failed. If no relatives can be found, his money will go to the government. But could it be meant for you? If the names William Daly or Kathleen Coomer mean anything to you or someone you know, you could have a fortune coming your way. One name that stood out for the air hunters on the Treasury's list of unclaimed estates was that of Charlotte Walker, who died leaving a small fortune of at least £100,000. A popular character in the peak village of Elsicar near Barnsley, she loved children, but sadly never had any of her own. Before she died, Charlotte reached a full century. Her late husband's great-niece remembers her birthday. She was up really early and she was waving at people in the street and shouting, hello, I'm 100 today. And she actually had a party and we had sort of all the family came and again, Bouncy Castle, we had a barbecue because she wanted a modern birthday. She sat out with a rug round her watching the children until she actually fell asleep outside because she was so tired. But she absolutely revelled in the whole day. Sadly, Charlotte died just five months later. But there is a shocking twist in this tale. Usually, when a name appears on the Treasury list, it's because there is no will. But Charlotte did make a will. She had left her entire estate to her husband's family in Barnsley, and she'd appointed her nephew Peter as the executor of the will. We took it along to the solicitors and gave it the solicitors. She said, oh, yes, we've got the deeds to the house. Uh, Hang on a minute, it's only got one signature on it, this will. Uh, and you're not direct descendants, so it's nothing to do with you. So at that time, it was just like somebody hitting you with a cricket bat. To make a legal will, of course, you have to have uh, two witnesses and they have to be able to read the will and witness your signature and sign it all at the same time. So. It's absolutely vital to, to not only make a will, but to make a will properly. And the only way to be insured of doing that is to do it through a qualified solicitor. With the will declared invalid, 
Charlotte's large estate of at least £100,000 has now been advertised on the Treasury's list of unclaimed estates. And right now, the air hunters are desperately trying to trace Charlotte's blood relatives to inherit. Hello, sorry, sorry, Mr Bott. And after just five hours on the case, they've made contact with a paternal cousin once removed, Alan Bott. And in Nottinghamshire, travelling air hunter Bob Smith has managed to see him. Oh, good morning. Hi, it's Robert Smith yeah. and Fraser and Fraser. I've yeah. got an appointment to come yeah. and see you. Yeah. Can I come in? Yes, jolly good fun. Thank you very much. <laughs> do you remember the lady Charlotte yeah. that we're yeah. talking about? You do. Yeah. She she lived in a big Victorian, well, a huge Victorian house, sat in its own grounds. Oh right. The house that she lived in and her <laughs> standard of living and the furniture and all that. Right. She was obviously. She was being a. A bookmaker's wife, she was reasonably well off, I would say. But she married a bookmaker, is that what you're saying? I heard that from her father. This news is very exciting. Could it be that the estate is worth substantially more than £100,000? The air hunters won't know for sure until the heirs submit the claim. Back in the office, researcher Debbie has been tracing relatives through the census information, and it seems there's no shortage of cousins. It's obviously a very fertile family. On one stem alone, she has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So the deceased has eleven cousins on one stem out of seven. Meanwhile, senior researcher Simon has ordered up copies of Charlotte's sister's wills, and as they feared, there might be a niece or nephew. It's the probates for the two sisters of the deceased, who we don't think had any children. And the wills would seem to suggest they don't have any children. There is, however, mention of a great niece, which would suggest that there might be a great niece of the deceased. This news could really put a spanner in the works. With their travelling air hunter already visiting a potential heir, they have no one on the ground to investigate this lead. Back in Nottinghamshire, there's an unwelcome surprise. There's been a call from a competing air hunter, but Alan is not having it. First come, first serve. I'm not interested in anything else. Okay, I've got enough bloody worries without fighting between companies. Sure. Having left the paperwork for Alan to consider, Bob phones the news into Tony. Whilst I was there, two other companies rang up. You're joking. No, but uh, I, I was told that uh, if Mr Bot has agreed that he will sign with me, he will sign with me. Back in London, Tony knows that even with the competition hot on their heels, they can't afford to take shortcuts. There are other companies looking at it, I know, and, uh, you know, so we do sort of try to speed up a bit, but you've still got to make sure that you're doing it properly, haven't you? So, you know, we don't know where it's going to lead to. And sure enough, there's another development. Simon has confirmed that the grandniece mentioned in Charlotte's sister's will is not a blood relative. We can stop panicking because... The, husband, the husband's niece is a Mrs Greenfield, and Marie Senior, who's a great-niece, is born as Greenfield in 1942. So she's the husband's niece, not the deceased's niece, in which case we're back to cousins. Now the team know for sure that they've taken the right track, finding cousins and signing Alan Bott. And just as well. So far, they've found around 20 heirs on Charlotte's father's side alone. Tony is concentrating on the maternal side of the tree. Charlotte's mother, Sarah, had seven brothers and sisters. The team have traced a marriage record for her sister, Esther, to a William Winsper. It's an unusual name. You hear us talk about good names and bad names all the time. A good name we can really do a lot more things with. We can gamble, and that's what Tony's doing here. He's taking a total gamble. He's got the phone book. He's using the name Winsper, uh, and he's just picked up people in the right area in the phone book. Um, now, from the sounds of it, he's got quite lucky. We think that the Winspers, provided it's the right Winspers, might have an entitlement, you see. It's the end of the day, and the team have already contacted over half of the heirs on Charlotte's father's side, and some on the maternal side. But whilst Charlotte's great age had been useful to begin with, it's now making things more difficult. Well, what's making this job hard, uh, and this family hard, is the age of the deceased, which is over 100 years of age. The birth rate at the time when, when the, the top line has been born is much higher than, than it would be on, the, on a usual case. And as the weeks go by, Tony is left counting heirs. 54, 55, 56. 56 could easily be 60, 70 heirs on it eventually. With so many heirs, it's likely their share of the £100,000 will be small, but still a pleasant windfall. Many are distant relations. The beneficiaries we're locating now, their grandparents 
are cousins of the deceased. So, you know, they're, they're, they're cousins, but three times removed. One of the last heirs they contact is on the maternal side. Charlotte's mother, Esther, had a grandson called Colin. He is Charlotte's first cousin once removed. The news of his inheritance has brought up mixed emotions. I never knew Charlotte Walker. It's a bit sad, somebody leaving me money that I'd never even met. We have been thinking about doing a family tree for some time, so once we knew the name, we started to delve into the family tree. That's Charlotte's mum's sister. Yep. Yeah. Colin's already got an idea of what to do with his share of the £100,000. If, if there's any money forthcoming, it would be nice to put it towards a trip and, and find out exactly what happened to Charlotte and the rest of the family. Without a valid will, under intestate law, only a blood relative can act on behalf of the deceased. Charlotte's family through marriage were told that even though they had known her all their life, they couldn't even carry out her last wishes. Being told that we were not Lottie's family, when all his, well, all his life we'd considered Lottie as family, uh, was very hard. My difficulty at the time was I'd lost Lottie a few days previously, and then on the day my dad came home and told me that, I felt like I'd lost her twice. Yeah, you Because do. I'd lost... I'd lost a right to call her my auntie somehow, and it took me a long time to get beyond that and to recognise for myself that she was my auntie and nobody could take that away from me. We've got the memories, that's it. We'll enjoy them. But uh, let it be a warning to everybody. Things are not that simple. As we've just seen, the impact of loved ones dying intestate can be devastating on the family left behind. But sometimes there is a silver lining. On rare occasions, family who never even knew of each other's existence can be brought together. For most, this is welcome news, but it can also be the start of an emotional journey. We always have to be very, very careful when we approach heirs in any investigation, because we never know quite what's around the corner, what we're going to open up or uncover. Cyril Curtis died on February the 9th, 2008, in Great Yarmouth, leaving an estate of £23,000. He had no family around him. So when Jeremy Ford of air hunting company Hoopers tracked down four entitled heirs to his £23,000 estate, they were surprised to hear of Cyril. But that wasn't the only shock. Two of those heirs were nieces Joyce Coley and Shirley Hughes. Oh, are we crossing here or are we walking down? They were both daughters of Cyril's brother Leonard, by two different mothers, and therefore half-sisters. But they'd never known of the other's existence. I went silent with shock um, and excitement, really, the thought that I had family out there. Which is strange. Never met any of the family at all. Never knew who they was. Didn't know they existed. Leonard Curtis had left his wife Hilda and daughter Shirley when Shirley was just three years old. He went on to meet Emily Shepherd, and whilst they never married, they did have a daughter, Joyce, who Leonard was a father to until his death. After an initial period of coming to terms with the news, Joyce agreed to meet Shirley on neutral ground. Neither sister had seen a photo of each other. When we were sitting in the the hotel foyer waiting for Shirley to come in. I'd got butterflies, I'd got stomach ache, I'd, I'd got everything that you could ever have and anxieties that was running through my head and I thought I'd made a mistake. Hello! <laughs> oh, it's lovely to be here. Oh, you're both steamed up. <laughs> Just a little bit. Oh, thank you. I'll bought you one as well. <laughs> thank you so Something much. Something to remind me. To be reminded by. Oh, dear. <laughs> yes. 
honestly, I'm, I'm so grateful for this. And, you know, um, oh, it's just, I just wish we could have met sooner. Yeah. You know, looking at you, we're so alike. We are it's insane. unbelievable. We're so alike. Oh. So, yeah. Put more or less chlorine mines out of a bottle. Yes, <laughs> yes, well, I need mine doing now, but that's Dad. That Our Dad. Gosh, that's him. Now, was that in London now or somewhere? It was Wales. Gosh, I can't believe that. Oh, that's lovely. And that's how I was always yeah. dressed. Just like that, constantly. Yeah. After their first meeting, the sisters have kept in touch but they are both still wrestling with a mixture of emotions. The last 10 months have been the most amazing time of my life. Suddenly to be thrust into this new family, you know, and it's lots and lots of new people, and you're learning about them every single day, and it's, it's been amazing. It's been a real roller coaster of a ride, it really has. We've seen quite a, a bit of each other since we first met. We um, met up in Lambda, no, they were on holiday in Rio. So we met up there for the day, had a nice day. And then they came here and stayed for a few days. But along with the joy of discovering each other, it's also been an unsettling time. When we do start the process of trying to bring heirs together, we're aware of the, the, the great many sensitivities involved, particularly when the relationship is very close, as in the case of, of Joyce and Shirley. Um, and, of course, there's a lot of anxieties involved and the whole process has to be delicately considered. Um, of course, there's, there's a number of uh, emotional hurdles that have to be uh, cleared. Joyce has returned to where her father's ashes were scattered 30 years ago. Until her father died just before her 15th birthday, she was the apple of his eye. Joyce was devoted to him. But a year on, the news that the father she worshipped for all those years had abandoned her half-sister Shirley has left Joyce questioning the past. If I could speak to my dad now, I'd ask him why he did what he did. Why did he set up a new life? Why did I come along? Why did he abandon Shirley the way he did? And I would love to ask him why he did that. Why was it such a secret? I don't understand. I don't think I ever will. And I don't think I'll ever find out the truth. But it would be nice to ask those questions now. I just wish he was here. I can't understand why Dad would cover up so much, really. He left my mum and I. As far as I know, he went to work in West Bromwich, and that was the reason he left was through work. Every time I mentioned him, I was told to be quiet. No one would talk about him, and I could never understand why. I thought, well, if he's just left work for a job, there must be, you know, something more to it, perhaps, than, than what there was. All that Shirley knows is that he left and sometime later had another daughter. There's eight years between us and um, in all those eight years there must have been something that's... Um, he's hidden from even perhaps her mum, we don't know. Um, or did her mum know everything? It's just, it's just one of those secrets that only we'll ever find out. For most of the 19th century, divorce was a difficult, expensive and scandalous process. Perhaps the plain fact is that Leonard could not find the courage to tell his two separate families the truth. Well, of course, Dad isn't here now, and there's just me and Shirley now, and we have finally found one another, and we're starting a new life together as best we can. If you would like to find out more about how to build a family tree or write a will, go to bbc.co.uk. Moving to the other side of the world, there can be no regrets when you're wanted down under in just a moment. Or stay right here and consider one of Britain's empty homes, bags of potential in Yorkshire, at 11 o'clock here on BBC One Scotland. <laughs> <laughs>